Good morning. My name is Ben Gott, and I'm coming to you on behalf of the Pequod Library from my home here in Fairfield. I've been a middle school teacher for 20 years and currently teach sixth grade English and serve as an advisor and the middle school coordinator for equity and inclusion at Green Farms Academy in Westport. A few days ago, I had the incredible opportunity to sit down virtually with New York Times bestselling author Judith Warner to talk about her book, And Then They Stopped Talking to Me, Making Sense of Middle School. Our conversation will follow this short introduction, and then you'll have a chance to ask Ms. Warner questions during her Facebook Live Q&A. But I can't let you go without talking for a moment about the Pequot Library. If you visit their website at pequotlibrary.org and click on the calendar link, you can find tons of information about their incredible virtual programming. Everything from digital author talks to digital book clubs, Facebook Live story time, and so, so much more. The Pequot Library is committed to keeping you connected with our community and with the world during this crazy time. So relax, look into your monitor, and enjoy this brief Q&A session with Judith Warner. I would like to welcome Judith Warner on behalf of the Pequot Library to today's Facebook Live Q&A. Ms. Warner, we are so happy to have you here to talk about your brand new book, And Then They Stopped Talking to Me, Making Sense of Middle School. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Very grateful. Absolutely. I, I just had a couple of questions. I know we want to get to the actual audience uh, and their questions, but I just had a couple of questions that I thought might be able to frame part of that discussion uh, and things that I was interested in myself. So uh, I wondered if uh, we could maybe talk about a, a few things and then we'll send you off on your way. Great. So my first question is this, you know, we know so much more about middle school aged young adults now than we did even a decade ago. and we know that because of the research that's been done, uh, social scientists, brain scientists, knowing that middle school will be different for different kids, particularly uh, kids who are coming from marginalized communities. What do we know now about middle school kids that we didn't know before? What are some things that we can say about middle school kids and their experiences in general? So one, one thing that I found particularly fascinating when I was researching this book is that a lot of the things that we know now and that seem new and are new in the degree to which we know them and the way we know them were actually known to some experts. And it was a small number, but still some at the turn of the 20th century, meaning that, you know, what observers had noted over centuries, that something new and exciting happens to kids' minds right around age 12, um, turned out to be absolutely true. Something happens to their brains, in fact. And at the turn of the 20th century, there were scientists who believed that. Now, they didn't have MRIs and fMRIs. first century that we know exactly what happens and why and so why you get these differences in the way their minds operate in very positive ways but still it's been known and it's almost as though it's been perennially forgotten at least by people who aren't educators who are specialized in working with these kids we focus on the negatives and we focus on the stereotypes but there's so much more going on with them at this age that we really should be and could be focusing on so that's one thing now we have the science to tell us what's happening on a brain development level to explain why there are all these changes we know now that puberty actually starts in the brain you know that the hormonal changes that cause the external changes that we're also familiar with come come from the brain initially which sets into motion the um the hormone changes that follow. Um, we also know that there's all kinds of new connectivity that's happening. Um, and also that the connectivity happens at different rates. So again, we have the science to prove what we've already known, that um, kids' emotional capabilities and sort of you know emotional revved upness happens in advance of the complete coming online of their rational faculties and their ability to kind of control themselves, control their emotions. Um, we've known this forever and now, now we know why, we can, we can see it. 
we also know a lot about the science behind the social stuff that they go through and that makes them so unhappy and drives us so crazy as adults, that there are brain changes that actually mean that they care more at that age, they're affected more, they're oriented toward, and they also experience more strongly and painfully issues around exclusion and belonging and what we put under the category of popularity. So I find all of that to be absolutely fascinating and also extremely useful because it gives us a new vocabulary for approaching these issues in something more of an objective way. And as an educator, I'm sure you already have these tools. You've had these tools for, for a long time. Um, but for parents, for whatever reason, this just kind of hasn't gotten out into the parent community. And so we're using a lot of the old judgmental words and stereotypes and operating a lot from our own emotions rather than being able to think a little bit more um, logically and dispassionately about what's going on. Sure. You know, that segues into uh, my next question. Well, one of the things that you did so beautifully in your book, and let's use the magic of editing to uh, pull the cover up on the screen, is that you <laughs> talk a lot about your own experiences as a researcher in the four years that you went on this journey. And I was really impressed by your willingness to talk about some of the stereotypes about middle school aged young people that you went into this project with, mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of the ways in which your conversations with both young adults and with parents helped you to kind of understand that those stereotypes weren't necessarily accurate. Those things that you talk about that we always just assumed are true. So I'm curious, you know, what were some things that you maybe thought were true at the beginning of your research about middle school aged young adults that your research and your interviews proved were not accurate? The crux of the problem, I think, for me, as for all of us, is that our perceptions about middle schoolers were formed when we ourselves were middle schoolers. So the kids have in our minds this enormous power, right? Because they were so important to us, what they thought, who they were, their ability to hurt us, their ability to make us happy. But, you know, especially we hold on to what hurt. They were so huge at that age, but we're not 12 anymore. And I think that we tend to underestimate the degree to which we actually change after that point. I mean, we know it externally, but our memories from that point are so clear. And intellectually, we're definitely growing into ourselves at that point. So it's easy to misjudge, frankly, how, how accurate our perceptions were. And of course, how accurate our memories were that's a problem at any age, but especially there because the, the memories are so emotionally laden. The second piece that's difficult is that our media has harped on an image of kids this age and early adolescents. I'm not gonna say middle schoolers because they were junior high schoolers when this really started as these kind of over, over sexed, you know, out of control, animal-like, even potentially dangerous creatures who are getting up to things prematurely, you know, that they shouldn't be. In more recent decades, it's also that their, um, you know, their level of cruelty is incessant and that they're, they're practically sociopathic, you know, in their capacities for emotional or even physical violence. And that's been, especially the sexual side of things, has been exaggerated grotesquely. You could say going back to the time when scientists first started researching and writing about this age group because the man who started it all off in the US, G. Stanley Hall, was obsessed with his own memories of going through puberty and the problems that it caused him because he was a Victorian, basically, and in an extremely moralistic Massachusetts environment where this was, I mean, just torture. And that, that sense of the torture of puberty just infused everything he did and everything that followed when the focus was just on boys. In the early 60s then, around the time the movie Lolita was made, there was this shift to seeing girls of 12 or 13 as young, dangerous, oversexed vixens. And I didn't really take in that it went back that far because I was thinking in terms of 
um, Lolita the Book, which came out a few years earlier, but is a very literary work, wouldn't have had the same impact. But the movie had that huge impact. And then this continued, and it really kind of reached an apex when I was that age, when I was in the 80s, where you had this kind of gross sexualization of, you know, pubescent girls, Brooke Shields and others. Um, that was considered almost part of the sexual liberation moment, that this was like some wonderful thing. There was very little pushback to it at the time. And then after that, there were various kinds of moral panics, as the historians say, about kids this age in the late 90s, going through the early 2000s. Um, and it's, it's crazy, but it, it sort of seeps in, you know, even if we're not entirely aware of all of what's being said in the media because we're younger or because in my case I was overseas during the you know the crazy stuff of the late 90s um, it still affects us somewhere because it's everywhere and so we come to this middle school moment then as parents expecting the worst expecting you know if not out and out depravity then just bad stuff and it's so exaggerated and there's so much that's left out and you know one of the things that you talk about that I've, I've never seen discussed in the 20 years I've been teaching middle school and working with middle school age young people is the fact that as adults, as you say, our own middle school experiences not only impact us as adults, right? Even in the ways in which we act and interact with other adults, but when our children reach that middle school age, we do tend to engage in some of those behaviors that we ourselves remember from middle school. And, and you, you gave some wonderful examples in the book of the ways that adults not only engage with other adults, but also engage with other kids and sort of building that, that power dynamic. And, you know, I can't tell you how many young people have said to me, you know, Mr. Gott, help me get off the, the merry-go-round, right? I don't want to do all of the sports. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. You know, my parents are saying, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. And, and one of the, the things that you talked about that really struck me was about the ways in which our own middle school experiences can impact the way that we behave toward other adults and toward our kids when they reach those ages of 11 to 14. Questioning that, thinking about that, wondering about it was really the spark that led to this entire book. It was when um, my daughter, you know, and I, I combined the two into one uh, for the sake of the book, I have two, was when my daughter was in middle school, I wasn't surprised by any of the stuff that was going on among the kids. If anything, the world of the kids seemed nicer than what my world had been like. I mean, there are good changes that have happened in our society in terms of what's permissible to say um, in, and in terms of the way schools try to create communities and try to instill some sense of what it means to treat one another decently. At least some, some schools do. I think many schools try to. Um, but what was really shocking to me was indeed the parent behavior, both, I mean, the degree of involvement, of course, was completely different than it was a generation ago. But also that the parents really seemed to regress uh, when their kids got to be that age in a completely different way than anything I'd ever seen before. They became a lot more miserable. They started warring with one another. They, there was just this kind of boundary shift that happened. And I think it's something that's very tempting for this generation of parents anyway. It kind of infuses our parenting at any age, but especially, especially there, it was just so striking. I mean, even to the point of, some of the moms starting to dress and look like the their daughters. And I just thought, I, I, I actually found an the 12 year olds are who are walking around inside of us. And that was the, that was the question, sort of just the creative or intellectual question that started the whole inquiry. You know, were we affected by who we had been at 12 in ways that we were not aware of or in control of why and how, you know, and why was that so powerful and how was it affecting us? As I worked on the book, my idea about that became a little bit more complicated. It wasn't just that. It was also being parents today, being parents of middle schoolers today, the environment that we parent in, the competitive and anxious 
and status oriented and also status anxious environment that so many of us are in. Um, that impacts us too and that gives a flavor to what we're doing and you know for example what the kids you're describing or saying to you about their parents pushing them there is a ratcheting up of anxiety about the future and competition when the kids get to be that age on the part of the parents as well as on the part of the kids and i think you know one of the things that makes the stories that you tell in your book so unique is the fact that you are you were not just in, you were not just engaging readers to give them advice about how to fix the thing. You were, you were engaging readers, parents, educators, all of us who deal with middle school age young people to do our own work too, right? To think about how we are engaging and making sure that we are engaging in a way that is honest, that is thoughtful, and that really respects the agency of the kids who are going through this right now versus our memories of ourselves when we were going through it back then. I remember Michael Thompson, the psychologist and author, who's just always one of my favorites, saying to me that when parents say to him that they know exactly how their kid feels or that their kid is exactly like them, the same thing happened, that he knows that they're not seeing their kid at all. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's one thing to sympathize and emphasize, emphasize, but we are different. And if we are looking through that lens, then we're not actually seeing the kid in front of us who needs, you know, really appreciate what you just said. I agree with you. I think that it is the work on ourselves that is most important for us to do. And certainly that's where my research led me. And that's what I feel like I'm in a position to be able to say to parents, having been a middle school parent, having needed to do that work, and also having learned so much from the process of writing this book, you know, whether from the interviews, all the people I spoke with, or all of the, the writing and the research I dug through, it gave me tools, even though my daughters are now much older, it gave me tools for understanding myself and them and other people generally that are applicable at any point in life. I mean, the last question I have for you really is what I was thinking about how to ask you about this current moment in a way that might not be the way that everybody else has been asking you about it. And I was thinking about, you know, the incredible work that, um, that you've done, that people like Lisa DeMore have done in thinking about mental health, thinking about the ways in which all of what's going on right now in the world is, uh, is impacting the mental health of, of uh, young adults and adolescents. And I was, I was thinking about summer vacation, which for, uh, for my students uh, starts very, very soon. If you as a parent are going to be engaging with your middle school age child a lot more now than you have in the past, I know that things can get tricky, right? It can be very difficult for all of us to be locked in a house, not able to go play with our friends. The disappointment is palpable uh, on the faces of every single student who I've been Zooming for the last two months. You know, they're glad to be together, but they're not really together. So I was thinking about some effective ways that parents can engage with their kids over the next weeks and months, knowing that, yes, the moment that we're in will have an endpoint, but also knowing that I think we're going to be back to some part of this. And, and I was thinking about choice, about the, the ability of parents to offer their kids choice, uh, even if it might not be an actual choice. But really, again, what are some ways that parents can engage their, their children effectively and really, again, help to uh, create that sense of agency within the home and within our current moment? I think the most important thing parents have to keep in mind is that their relationship with their children is more important than whatever activity they believe they should be doing mm -hmm. or achievement they should be acquiring. And I think that a lot of parents right now um, in communities like mine or communities like yours are worried that their kids are going to be falling behind academically because of the way the school year ended and they're going to want to pile on during the summer and I think that's the biggest mistake they can make because kids are losing the ability to do the usual things that they do in the summertime where they get to recharge they get to recharge their batteries they're there and they're most likely not going to get to do those things or at least a lot of them aren't going to get to and they need a reset. They have to recharge their batteries. And I think you're absolutely right. Parents have to give them choices of how they're gonna spend their time. 
and also help them do the things that matter to them and that they enjoy. They need to be able to have a good time. You know, they, they absolutely need to be able to relax and have a good time. And that doesn't mean watching video games all day. I mean, you know, or being online all day, because that actually isn't relaxing, right? It means being able to have a set of choices that can get at some of the things that kids love to do during the summers, you know, be outside or do arts and crafts stuff or music or, or musical theater, or whatever it is that particular um, kids like, they, they, there's gotta be some point of access to at least the things, you know, some semblance of the things that they actually enjoy. And the worst thing that parents could do is keep up the stress of the, of the present moment. You know, so many households right now, this is always a hard time of year. I remember when, my, especially when my kids were middle school age, this was just a sort of high pressure time of year where everything was coming together. The social stuff was the worst. You know, there were all these end of year things to do and everyone's head was blowing off. I mean, the social stuff is gone, but what just what from I'm hearing, hearing around me is that households are just reaching a point of, of stress that's unbearable. That has to stop. No matter what it takes, that's got to stop because that can become really toxic. Absolutely. Judith Warner, author of And Then They Stop Talking to Me, Making Sense of Middle School. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. And uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, hearing your thoughts and I'm really thrilled to have had you here in my living room uh, on behalf of the Pequot Library. Thanks again. So I'm not sure if people can hear me. Hopefully you can. And um, thank you to everyone who's here. I want to say thank you to Ben again for a really fantastic interview. I, I just so appreciated it and I was so glad to have the opportunity to speak to him and be able to ask him questions um, because he's a real expert in all his years of uh, working with kids this age. And i um, really glad to be back today. And again, I am hoping that um, you're able to hear me. I wanted to just first answer the question I see about um, uh, do I think that, um, do I have thoughts on boundaries, tech related and otherwise? This is a question from Margaret Hunt Reek. Um, agency is great, but do you think there's a time when as parents we need to rein that in? You know, this is something that I really have thought about a lot and, and kind of worried about my own views on because they are really different by and large from the views of other parents, uh, parents I knew at the time that my daughters were of middle school age when of course there was a lot less of the social media stuff that there is now and there was just sort of tech was a little bit a little bit less omnipresent um with my older daughter it was still flip phones with my younger daughter it was the start of iphones which pretty much changed everything um but in talking to experts since the book has come out more and more and frankly asking them back the same question when they ask me for my thoughts i have come to be more kind of more set in believing what I think, which is that I think privacy and boundaries are more important than having the illusory sense that you know what's going on with your kids. So just to backtrack for a moment, you need to know what's going on with your kids, especially if you suspect that something really bad is happening, like they're being bullied or they're you know doing drugs or getting up to something dangerous spying on your kids is not the way to go about that. I think that that will necessarily always backfire and is the kind of step that should be taken only under real duress and in essentially, you know, a situation of emergency. It erodes trust. It, in, it will actually increase your own anxiety and it doesn't work because no matter what, they're going to outsmart you tech-wise. They're always going to have um, some private account you don't know about you may be following them on Instagram and they've got a Finsta that you're not seeing or, you know, they've taken another screen name and they're doing something else or they're on one of the sites where things pretty much disappear as soon as they're posted. Um, I just think it is a losing battle. And from what I have seen, it really increases parent anxiety rather than assuages it. I also think that there is the problem of you're reading private material and you don't really know what you're reading in that you don't know the spirit in which it was said. 
you don't know the kind of private language in between your um, kid and his or her friends, the way they talk to each other. I mean, most of the time, the language that they're using is going to sound absolutely horrible. The things they're saying are going to seem vile. And it's going to, it's just going to seem like the end of the world. But to them, it actually may be just words. And I'm not talking about racist speech or bullying speech, you know, both of which are completely unacceptable. I'm, and dangerous and need adult intervention. I'm talking about the plain old kind of gross out stuff that goes on among kids that age. And I know um, that Margaret said, you know, when I indicated that I think middle school isn't quite as bad as when we were there, my kids must have gone to a different school. Um, you know, maybe it was just that when I was that age, I was, you know, in a place and living at a time where things were pretty bad. Um, and I remember a lot of really gross stuff going on. And, you know, things that today would fall into the category of sexual harassment were just kind of the way it was at that point. And of course, we didn't have any kind of technology for um, sexting, but the notes that were passed were pretty gross. Um, and, you know, the content was, you know, extremely objectionable and parents would have been really upset if they had seen it. But it's the same sort of thing that middle schoolers are sending back and forth by text now. So all of that to say, there needs to be a better mode of communication than monitoring you know, kids um, ostensibly private social media. That's that's my feeling, and I have heard that backed up by by educators and school administrators and other experts since. Um, okay, go on to the next. Um, I'm reading now Caroline Crawford's question. My daughter, 12 years old, was so cool, and just literally this morning, I was afraid to go into what was afraid to go into camp by herself. Any advice? I mean, remember that a lot of the coolness of being that age is something that kids are trying on to cover up for how vulnerable they're actually feeling and to find some sort of external identity that makes them feel good and solid um, and like they belong, like they fit in, that they're not in this awkward place of, of emerging from the shell of family into the wider world. I mean, I can remember so clearly wanting certain clothing, you know, shoes, because it was like a uniform. If I had those pieces of the uniform, then I knew kind of who I was and where I fit. And I could kind of go into autopilot with some sort of confidence that I was the way I needed to be. But of course there was, you know, there were a million other very different feelings underneath. So I would just say that, you know, her seeming cool and yet her fear about going into camp by herself are not, you know, contradictory. And advice wise, I would say if she gives you an opening to talk about it and acknowledge it, do so lightly without making a big deal out of it, you know, so that you kind of build confidence rather than, as Michael Thompson puts it, interviewing for pain. Um, because she just needs to go be who she is. I mean, if there's something more going on, if you get the sense that there's some really greater degree of distress, it could be that there's a bad so social situation maybe that she's either in anticipating or has already encountered and maybe she could use a little coaching on how to deal with it or just need to talk it through and then have you help her problem solve around it, or, you know, have you tell, suggest to her that she go to speak to one of the counselors who could maybe not to sort of report it, but for help in problem solving, you know, in figuring out for herself the best way to handle it. So I think that I have gone through the questions that were there. I think I've missed anything. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Ask questions of Ben too, if if, if possible. Um, I know that I actually was really eager to hear him speak about about identity and racism because when he and I spoke, it was back in May, before everything that happened, you know, with George Floyd, with Black Lives Matter, and I was wondering first, you know, how 
kids he knows and works with are processing all of this, if he has advice about the right tone to take, and also just kind of what he's seen in his years doing um, diversity and inclusion work in a middle school. But again, I, I don't I don't know if he hears me or is, is able to jump on and comment. Um, okay, here's a question from Jenny Pratt. I have two girls, two years apart. What do you think are the most important values and lessons to instill while they are still young that will help them navigate middle school years with a reduced risk of trauma. So I think from the earliest possible age to be thinking about friendship, not so much in terms of how other people perceive you or feel about you, but rather in terms of how you feel about them, how you feel being with them, whether they make you feel good and happy and valued and seen and just just basically if you feel good about yourself with somebody or with some group of people and using that as the standard for kind of what's desirable in friendship or what you know being in a good social circle means as opposed to thinking about who the popular kids are um, you know who the in crowd is where you're supposed to be because moving in the direction of the you know what you're who you're supposed to be with or the person you're supposed to be or the you know getting into some crowd because it's high status pretty much always leads to unhappiness. Whereas going with what genuinely feels good and being with others leads to happiness, will stay with you. And that works, you know, is certainly the answer to happiness in relationships at any point in life. But I think it's particularly important in the middle school years when popularity and hierarchy, status, etc., become such a huge preoccupation. waiting for more questions, just also thinking about values and lessons to navigate middle school with a reduced risk of trauma. I think once again, the values that you can demonstrate as opposed to sort of give voice to just put into nice words from as early as possible will get internalized, you know, whether kids admit to it or not, and especially when they're in the middle school years, they're not going to want to, you know, say that they're taking on your views or that they're parroting your views. They'll, they'll act like they're rejecting them. And then you may very well hear them sort of coming from their mouths when they think you're not listening, when you think you're not around. Um, but values around inclusion, about how you tr uh, treat people and also how you value people, right? I mean, and that's something that we tend to get across implicitly even more than explicitly. And it really comes down to who we include, who we consider worthy of talking to and acknowledging and being polite to. Um, those are lessons that are so important early on and maybe they are not the things that lead someone to be popular, but they do lead to somebody being happy and secure and at home in the world and also being genuinely liked by other people for for who they are and what they bring and the kindness and decency that they bring as opposed to whatever sort of status or good looks or stuff they bring with them. Um, the books that I am currently reading, um, let's see, I'm reading a few simultaneously. Um, I am starting to read a new memoir by a writer, Delaunay Michelle. I'm listening to Howard's End, which I read in college now decades ago and I am also reading I'm embarrassed to admit this happens to me all the time I'm reading a new American Library collection of um, short novels by to tell you Robert Lowell's wife whose name I have of course forgotten his first wife I think who was a mid-century American writer and who's maybe somebody who's um, on the chat right now is going to be able to fill in the blanks for me as to who I'm reading um, this happens to me all the time that basically you know whoever I'm reading I don't remember the uh, my mind goes blank when asked um, but anyway those are the things that I am reading simultaneously I'm not sure if there's anything else that I'm forgetting but I my husband got me that last one as a birthday gift because I'm just fascinated but with by everything 
mid-century American, um, whether it shows like Mad Men that were set in that period, or fiction from that period, or historical writing about the period. Um, especially fiction that's not necessarily considered great literature that I would have encountered in school, um, but that are books that, that people were commonly reading at that point. Um, because I think that it brings you more in, in contact with the way people were thinking since it was popular fiction. I'm very embarrassed not to be able to remember her name. I would Google it if it wasn't going to mess up my ability to look at the screen. I do remember, though, that a lot of the books that went on to become my, you know, lifelong favorites, I probably first discovered when I was about middle school age, um, like Jane Eyre. Um, so many of my tastes were formed at that time. Wondering if there are any parents of boys who are online right now who might have questions or comments. Um, non-school recommended recommendations is there a question about now um in terms of in terms of sort of living life or in terms of sort of getting along as a family um no i don't no i don't think it's elizabeth hardwick this is very embarrassing um you're like sending somebody in my family down to bring me the book and actually text for that um, but Jenny, can, do you mind elaborating on your question? How do you think parents can help their kids deal with the uncertainty of the upcoming school year? That's really hard. That is really hard for all of us right now. The uncertainty of this moment is, um, you know, pre precisely what really erodes people's well-being, people's mental well-being, not knowing what's going to happen, not having any sense of control. I think that you are, we, as parents, are going to have to try to be, hard though it is, as zen as possible about it and try not to catastrophize, try to send the message that, yeah, you know, this sucks, but it's going to be okay because we're going to be okay, we're going to be together. You will have ways of being in touch with your friends. You will be able to, to some extent, be in, even if it's quote unquote, in school, life is not going to come to an end and everything is going to be okay. Um, this is a really interesting time. One of my daughters said the other day, you know, um, that they were really tired of perennially li living through a very interesting moment in history. It's true, you know, this, especially um, Gen Z has maybe had a bit more you know, more events of historical interest than are necessarily uh, good for them or, or pleasant. But this is where we are. We have to kind of make the best of a bad situation to the extent that we can. I do know that I have heard from a number of parents um, that, oddly enough, not being in school, not having the social day-to-day -day has in some ways been a relief. For kids who were struggling socially, who were excluded, or even who weren't excluded, but who were in some sort of toxic group where they had to worry about exclusion, where they, you know, had to anticipate it all of the time, they don't have to. You know, if they were the one who couldn't find a seat at the table in the lunchroom, at least they don't have to deal with that day in and day out. They don't have to deal with not being chosen for group work or not being able to find a, you know, a place in a cluster of desks in the classroom, or all of the other really not little things that chip away at someone's sense of, of self and well-being and that happens so often in the middle school years. I've also heard of, you know, kids reconnecting in a stronger way to elementary school friends who they had lost touch with because maybe they weren't moving in the same circle anymore, or it wasn't cool to be in touch anymore, or whatever, but you know, these were old, solid friendships that they've been able to reconnect through. And, um, you know, in some ways, they're going to rediscover what we knew in the past. They're going to rediscover the phone, even if it's FaceTime, you know, if it's by video. There are ways to at least be connected, you know, as opposed to being completely isolated. It's not the same thing, obviously, and it's not a good situation. And, you know, we all can count ourselves very lucky if we 
have family members who are not sick or haven't died or, you know, we're not facing bankruptcy. It is a terrible, terrible time. But, you know, to that point, I also at the same time don't think it's helpful to say to kids who are dealing with this kind of uncertainty or grief, let's say, of what they're missing out, you know, just be glad that, you know, we're not sick and in the hospital because that never makes anyone feel better. Um, I think this is a question of the favorite books I was thinking of. Other favorite books from the time? Pride and Prejudice, for sure. Rebecca um, by Daphne du Maurier. Um, I loved all of those, you know. All of those really stayed with me. I think I read F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald for the first time. He's not a favorite anymore, but he was for a very long time. And I, so many of the interests I have now, the things that I went on to do in my life that really mattered to me, those interests were born at that time. And I didn't remember it until shortly before I started writing the book. I came across these pages that I had written um, two weeks before eighth grade graduation where I talked about my life in, in enormous depth. And it was the answers to some sort of questionnaire. And I talked about wanting to become fluent in French and live in France. And I talked about books, which were clearly such a huge, huge part of my life, and wanting to become a writer. So those were nice things to rediscover, and they were certainly not the memories that I had carried forward. Oh, and the favorite books I was thinking of, maybe that's what you meant about non-school recommended recommendations. I guess it tells you how nerdy I actually am that those those were those were my favorites. Um, we actually were not reading them in school. And um, for whatever reason, the school I was in at the time didn't have a very inspiring or interesting or engaging um, English curriculum. And I was really starved for additional reading outside of school. I feel guilty saying that. I guess my um, eighth grade teacher was very nice and tried to address it, but he was new at the time. I loved Agatha Christie at that point, too. Is there anybody else? not um, we can we can we can sign off I'll just wait to get confirmation from someone um, about what to do not sure what to do um, anybody well I really really appreciate everyone's presence today um, everyone coming online and spending this hour in the afternoon with me and with Ben and with the Pequot Library, which, you know, does such great programming. Really grateful to have been here and uh, to have been able to chat. So, you know, have a great rest of the day and I hope to see you all again and hopefully in person. I am dying to see your library in person because it looks absolutely incredible. So thanks so much. Have a good rest of the afternoon and evening.